animals that are very long lived, they actually stay fit to the very end. And the human centenarians, people who live to their 100s and beyond, uh, they also have extended period of healthy lifespan. So that's really what we are working for. for. Welcome to the Seamland podcast. I'm your host, Seamland. And today our guest is Dr. Vera Gorbonova. Vera is a professor of biology at the University of Rochester and a co-director of the Rochester Aging Research Center. She has published over 100 publications about longevity, sirtuins, and aging. This episode is brought to you by DoNotAge.org. DoNotAge offers different kind of molecules as supplements that have been seen to have a longevity benefit, such as NMN, trimethylglycine, apigenin, and hyaluronic acid. Dr. Vera is one of the advisors of DoNotAge, and I'm also taking their products. You can get a small 5% discount at donotage.org if you use the code SIM, S-I-I-M. Dr. Vera, welcome to the show. Thank you. Yeah, it's, I'm glad to speak with you. And uh, it's, um, you know, this longevity field is very um, exciting and there's always like this new uh, discoveries being made. Uh, but, uh, you know, maybe let's start with uh, how did you become like a longevity scientist? What, what made you like uh, interested in it? Well, I, I think extending human lifespan and health span is just a very, very exciting topic. Um, you know, if you if you are a scientist, biologist, then many topics seem exciting. But then the question is, um, do they seem equally exciting to many other people <laughs> besides right. you? And there are some topics that only make very few people excited. Uh, but with aging and longevity, it's just relevant to everyone. And this is what was very attractive to me that uh, first, it's a very fundamental biological problem because every living thing ages and finding out how that happens and how this can be prevented. It's just very important scientifically without even thinking about the application mm. of it. But then, you know, from human <laughs> standpoint, extending health and life uh, this is so relevant to everything that's going on now in society that you know that just seemed like really a worthwhile <laughs> problem to study right right yeah it is like some of the biggest one of the biggest problems uh mankind and uh, humans have been thinking about you know since the dawn of our species all the time and uh, like how do we like what is death etc and uh, how do we resolve aging but yeah, like from I agree with that yes like people were looking for the fountain of youth <laughs> and you can yeah see it in all the novels and the fairy tales <laughs> yeah yeah exactly and from a, like a practical standpoint it's also very uh, useful because you know aging uh, wastes a lot of resources in a sense that um, you know that you have these comorbidities they um, take a lot of uh, resources and uh, if we were to solve let's say uh, this uh, deterioration of the human body and uh, that happens uh, with aging then we would also have just more uh, like productive years and uh, you know more just uh, more uh, i don't know just a more functioning society as a whole yeah you are exactly right a lot of resources being spent towards the end of life uh when people become frail uh and the, yeah well it's also a lot of human suffering um so when we talk about extending lifespan we are not talking about extending frailty years we are talking about healthy lifespan and uh, it is very clear that from model organisms that we study uh, that you know animals that are very long lived they actually stay fit mm. uh, to the very end and the human centenarians people who live to their 100s and beyond uh, they also have extended period of healthy lifespan so that's really what we are working for for Mm. to achieve it for everyone so that everyone could live to 100 and uh, keep active yeah yeah that's 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 one of the big misconceptions about uh even, even like you know extending lifespan doesn't necessarily equal like immortality like you can still die it's just that you're extending this um yeah like the functional health and the functional health span that you can stay exactly. quote unquote biologically younger for longer uh, that mm -hmm. is what but that is actually what is uh, meant by the soul engaging it doesn't mean like immortality and then things it's more it is this idea behind solving all these comorbidities that happen with aging like uh, cancer and diabetes and uh, newer degeneration and uh, those things yeah that's extremely important because so far medicine was approaching every disease separately but now in developed nations um aging is really the underlying cause of all those diseases diabetes cancer heart disease if we slow down aging then we take care of everything 
mm, <laughs> every right. such right. disease. Yeah, what do you think, or what what has your research led to? Like, what is causing aging, then, <laughs> or what is making us, you know, age? Well, it, it's a very complicated, of course, scientific problem. So it does. It's unlikely that there is just one single cause, and people talk about multiple organ systems and molecular system deteriorating over time. Um, recently, I think one of the most, uh, there is a lot of attention that's going to epigenome deterioration. So our DNA, well, we know that mutations accumulate over time and there was always a lot of debate. Uh, does it explain aging process? Uh, but now we start thinking beyond mutations because mutations is when DNA sequence changes. Uh, but besides that, DNA is packaged in a certain way in the cell so that it can be organized and accessible to other enzymes. And over time, this packaging starts to deteriorate. So like you can't even find what you need to find. It's like, you know, a drawer when everything is disorganized. Let's say you need this gene to be active, but you can't find it. Mm. Uh, so that is one of the very big problems uh, that over time, not only we have mutations, but we just have this general disorganization of the DNA uh, and uh, it affects function of the cells. Like, for example, in the young tissue, if it's a liver, so every liver cell works like a liver cell and they're very uniform and they work together very nicely. But in the old liver, one cell does this, one cell does that. So that really creates dysfunction on the organ level. And that is, you know, one of the problem. I'm not saying this is the only one, but this is one of the processes that kind of controls a lot of what's ha happening inside the cell. So if the DNA is not packaged correctly, that means the right genes are not activated correctly, and then maybe wrong genes are activated when they shouldn't. Mm -hmm. uh, so all this leads to functional consequences. Right. Yeah, like so genetically, we are like programmed to uh, age, uh, like the, the aging is in, in the genes, uh, but the epigenetics determines the speed of that, that process, like does it speed up because like some people are, you know, very old and uh, get this comorbidities even in the 40s, whereas others are, you know, living very healthily until their 90s and uh, 100s. So it's like this, yeah, the epigenome is still, you know, affecting uh, the speed of this, uh, you know, yes, the yes. Aging, aging clock. That's true. Yeah, because it's it's wrong to think that there is like an aging gene that just kind of kills us. Right. Uh, but more what's determined is the rate by which things start to deteriorate. And uh, for example, if you are a mouse, everything starts to fall apart by one year of age. But if you are a human, you know, that happens much later, maybe in the 50s and 60s and also humans are very different from each other. For some of us, it happens later, mm -hmm. sooner or later. So yeah, there are these differences in how well we can deal with this damage, because let's say when DNA is open due to some damaging event, then it can still be repaired and put together, but um, it's never 100%. And maybe when we are young, everything is being repaired very nicely, but when we get older, things are not repaired anymore. <laughs> Okay, nice. So, but but, but what are the things then uh, that uh, what, what are the things that you know speed it up or like make the aging happen faster? Uh, things that speed up aging. Yeah, yeah. Uh, this uh, epigenetics and. Well, so it's mostly you know inability to restore proper structure over time because let's say when you need to activate a gene so that. Chromatin needs to, chromatin, that's the packaging of DNA, needs to open up. But then once this gene is no longer needed, it needs to be put packaged back. Uh, and then, or if there is a break in DNA that's induced from damaging agent or from some free radical passing by, uh, again, there are systems in the cell to repair it. And if the system works very well, then, you know, we can handle damage. Uh, mm -hmm. But when those repair systems start to fall apart, um, so that's when the problem begins because our cells do not no longer keep up with the damage. And really, my belief is the function of these repair systems, what really determines how well we deal with um, challenges and stressors. Um, so it's a well-known fact, even if you 
think about kind of generic stress, old people are much less capable of dealing with stress. Um, so that's really that kind of a concept of resilience. When we are young, we're very resilient, but then it starts to deteriorate. Um, so there are various ways, uh, you know, there are all these repair systems uh, that provide us with resilience and those systems start to be less efficient. So uh, if we want to extend the lifespan and really get to the whole basics of it, like the underlying cause, so I would think we need to find ways to stimulate those repair systems. Hmm. So maybe like a few examples of them are like telomeres and uh, DNA repair. And uh, that's all thing. Right, right. So stimulate DNA repair. Well, telomeres, you know, this is a very beautiful concept because of its simplicity. They shorten and that it uses genomic instability. Um, you know, it, shortening does cause problems. Uh, but for majority of people, that's not really the main driver because our telomeres just don't get short enough to cause serious disease within our lifetimes. Um, so I would say telomeres are important, but it's not that, you know, once you make them a little longer, that's going to solve all the problems because for many tissues, many people, you know, telomeres are okay. <laughs> I mean, there are certain people for, who have really short telomeres, then it's a problem, but sort of average telomere is enough for our lives. <laughs> mm, okay. Right. So it's not that, uh... So it's not that this is like the main uh, reason why we age, that the telomeres aren't the main, main reason. Doesn't look like that. There was a lot of excitement about telomeres, you know, when they were first discovered. Mm. Uh, but right now, it doesn't seem like this is really the universal cause mm. of aging. Right. So uh, do you th would you think like DNA is more important than DNA repair? Oh. And uh, yeah, I would say DNA repair and uh, also that uh, maintaining epigenome structure is more important. And telomeres also play into the mix because uh, DNA, they're also part of the DNA. And when telomeres get very short, uh, that also contributes to kind of disorganization because genes that are close to telomere, most of them are supposed to be silent. But if telomeres get short, then those genes start to be activated and often that's undesirable. So it's, you know, it can contribute to the mess, <laughs> obviously. Right. Uh, but uh, even beyond telomeres, just keeping DNA well organized is very important. Mm -hmm. Okay. So uh, what are some of the ways then uh, we can do that <laughs> of uh, keeping the DNA more organized? Uh, yeah, well, that, that's a good question because um, right now many researchers are working on it, that there are different approaches that people try. It's not that we have a, really a good way of doing it yet. Um, we're just learning how to do that. There are many enzymes in the cell that their job is to keep DNA well organized. Uh, and sirtuins are just some of these enzymes. And uh, my group works specifically on sirtuin 6, whose job is to uh, take DNA especially those parts of the DNA that have to be silenced, that we actually don't want them to be active. And sirtuin 6 keeps them silent. Mm -hmm. uh, when sirtuin 6 function starts to decline, so then we get activation of different parasitic elements in DNA, like there are so-called transposons uh, that were first discovered in a maze by Barbara McClintock. Uh, so she found those selfish genes in DNA. They just live there like parasites. They, most of the time, our cell keeps them silent. Uh, but when we get older, and that's what was already published more recently by us and other researchers, that as we get older, transposons start to be activated because those systems that keep them silent start to fail. And these parasites get out of control. Uh, so, again, another reason to keep them silent, otherwise they start to be expressed and they cause inflammation. And inflammation is really underlying a cause of many age-related diseases. We want to reduce that inflammation. Uh, so what we are looking into is how to activate sirtuin 6 mm -hmm. Because if we activate it, then hopefully we can um, keep DNA more organized and also keep those transposons in check. Right, right, right. 
Yeah, I actually saw this uh, recent study as well um, that uh, the uh, re restoring cert six levels uh, was able to um, like help with the longevity or like it re helps with restore some of the longevity of some mice and things. And there are also mm -hmm. some other studies where they said, well, the the um, if the uh, cert six genes are basically like deleted or uh, mutated, then they don't live longer at all. So it's, it appears to be have like some a very important role in uh, just longevity and uh, aging. Yes, yes. So certain six is really interesting because it has, um, you know, this very profound connection to longevity. Uh, and the paper you're referring to by Heim Cohen's group, so they were even looking at the different function of certain six, its role in regulating metabolic genes. I mean, again, regulating genes, so that's what certain six is doing, but also metabolism. And they found that adding extra copy of certain six was making mice live longer. Uh, and then uh, Raul Mostoslavsky group uh, several years before showed that if you mutate it, then you get these very progeric uh, short-lived mice. So really it looks like CERT6 uh, is a longevity gene and uh, many people are looking for activators, obviously. Mm -hmm. Well, it's not that we have uh, something that, you know, a, a drug like activator that <laughs> <laughs> ready for people to take it, but there are natural compounds uh, that um, show some activity. <laughs> yeah, yeah. How do how do the sirtuins work then? Uh, like, um, what is the me mechanism that they have these longevity effects? Well, so sirtuins that they are enzymes. Uh, they can modify other proteins in the cell. And what there are, sirtuins, it's a family of genes. So when we say sirtuins, there are, some of them, they have very different functions. Uh, some of them are in the mitochondria, some in the nucleus. So right now we are talking more about the nucleus sirtuin 6. Uh, and it works by taking DNA and um, also recruiting different um, other proteins that are responsible for packaging DNA and the silencing regions of DNA that should be silent, like transposons, for example. And also it participates in activating genes, for example, genes involved in stress response. Uh, so if we experience stress, then we need sirtuin 6 for you know, the optimal response to stress. Uh, so, yeah, that, that's kind of, <laughs> put it simply, the mechanism of action. So it has two enzymatic activity. It can uh, deacetylate proteins. It can monoadp ribosylate proteins. And these uh, modifications, they serve as signals for proteins to take action and, for example, compact DNA or open it up. Mm -hmm. um, so that's sort of mechanism of work. Uh, it was shown that sirtuin 6 can be activated by certain fatty acids like fish oil, you know, which we know is a healthy thing. Mm -hmm. uh, and also it was shown that sirtuin 6 can be activated by fucoidin, uh, which is a, a polysaccharide from uh, brown algae. And what I find really exciting that uh, brown algae, uh, fucoidin, even independently of sirtuin 6 was shown to have many health benefits. Mm. And um, people consume a lot of algae in uh, Japan and South Korea. And right. these are two countries with the highest life expectancy. So <laughs> they right, right, must right. be doing something right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that is that uh, they consume a lot of it. And uh, there's yeah, many nutrients in there like iodine and uh, K vitamins and uh, those things. So, yeah, like even besides the sirtuins, <laughs> it's uh, generally yes. like a pretty healthy food. Uh, but uh, like, uh, what is the human research um, in uh, in in, in sirtuins and longevity? Like, uh, does it does it, does that find also that uh, sirtuins have like this direct effect on longevity and lifespan? That's a good question. So we have a paper that we are you know in the process of publishing. So I cannot you know reveal too many details, but I can just say that we found a mutation in human centenarians, and so people that live beyond one hundred in sirtuin 6 that makes sirtuin 6 more active. Uh, so it's still, it's a rare mutation. Not every person who lives to 100 should have it. it it's rare, but it, it's found more frequently in centenarians. So we see this link between more active sirt 6 and living to 100. Mm, okay. So that's uh, pretty interesting. Yeah, because sometimes like people, um, 
the reason why they live longer, like centenarians, have to do with actually the, yeah, the genetics, uh, like the mm -hmm. certain like sirtuin genes or Foxo protein genes as well. Uh, those are usually they have like a higher expression of them or more copies of them. Right. So we collaborated with a group of uh, Yusin Su from Columbia University, and she found this mutation. And then we engineered this mutation in cells and we looked at the, you know, the activity, the function, and we see that it gives enhanced function. Hmm. Yeah. And of course, there's also like very difficult to do this uh, human research because like humans live like very long. <laughs> like uh, if you try to give someone like this, let's say sirtuin activators or increase their sirtuin genes uh, starting from their like, let's say teenage years, then it's going to take a like, long time to see like whether or not it's actually working. <laughs> right. Yeah. So we cannot do real lifespan experiments on humans, but recently there were different biomarkers developed like uh, another great colleague uh, of ours, uh, Steve Horvath, he developed this methylation clock biomarker. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, another experiment, we are right in the process of doing it. So we express sirtuin, extra dose of sirtuin-6 in human cells. And then we culture these cells for some time. And then we send them back to Steve to look at methylation age. And mm -hmm. we will see if it made the cells younger. So I don't know the result yet. <laughs> Just right. doing this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've also, I've also used the uh, methylation clock, and it's something that like there's always like changing, so to say that um, it's not permanent in essence. That if you are doing, let's say, some good li healthy lifestyle changes, and you see your uh, methylation age uh, decreasing, then you have to kind of keep at it, so to say, because if mm -hmm. you reverse back to your bad lifestyle habits, then those the, you're you're gonna basically come back, you're gonna rebound to like a, just a higher age, so to say. That if you if you don't keep up with the healthy habits, then uh, you're still gonna act, you have the potential to accelerate your age, even if you have decreased it in the past. Yes, yes. Now it's a very good biomarker. It, it's real. Uh, it, it is really very very useful for people, um, you know, trying all anti aging interventions because you can do take. Um, use that intervention for maybe six months and then test your methylation age and you see which way it's changing so it's great you don't need to wait 200 years right so what are some of the ways to uh, activate sirtuins then you mentioned the sirt 6 activator and some other things well for coiden you know this is something we are studying right now we are very excited about this compound because of other health benefits that were already demonstrated, but we now link it to sirtuin 6. Uh, and then, you know, besides that, all kinds of uh, healthy behaviors actually activate sirtuin, such as exercise, color restriction was shown to activate sirtuin. So there is really this nice connection between sirtuin activity and all those uh, healthy behaviors we already know about. Uh, but yeah, with Fucoidin, that's really very promising. Um, it's interesting that Fucoidin is not, um, you know, the molecule is variable because it comes from algae and different algae have different, slightly different chemical formula of it. Uh, so we find that certain uh, preparations activate CERT6 while others don't. So it's important also <laughs> to know which one you're taking. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, but you've uh, I've also, you know, a lot of people have heard about resveratrol being like this uh, sirtuin activator. Like, uh, does, what do you think about that? Well, you know, it's been very controversial because some people saw benefits of resveratrol. Other people said, oh, well, they couldn't uh, replicate sirtuin. But that's sirtuin-1 activation. So that's, you know, a different member of sirtuin family. With sirtuin-6, um, I'm not aware that resveratrol works on it. So resveratrol may have other benefits beyond <laughs> sirtuin activation. And there are many people now researching it uh, for other benefits. But in terms of sirtuin-6 activation, yeah, I don't think that's been demonstrated. Okay. Uh, is there anything else? Like you mentioned fish oil, any other compounds? Um, well, in terms of compounds, uh, you know, that's probably all. Uh, well, there are other, you know, flavonoids from berries that some, there are some reports that they activate sirtuin. So I think in general, eating berries is a good thing, mm. uh, but uh, uh, there hasn't really been, you know, a very strong activator. Um, mm. You know, blueberries, yeah. So there are some studies showing that blueberries have effect. 
Um, so yeah, I think we still very much need to find more potent activators of sirtuin 6 And uh, at this point, I would say, yeah, for, from natural compounds, Fucoidin shows the greatest effect. Um, you know, another detail about it, and that is, you know, more <laughs> sort of technical thing, but uh, I mentioned that there are two enzymatic activities in sirtuin 6 uh, So it can deacetylate proteins and it can add a molecule of sugar, ribose. So these are two in different enzymatic activities. Many people were looking for activators of deacetylation uh, just because of the simplicity of the assay in, involved. Uh, but now we see more evidence that the second activity is more important. <laughs> so that's really where we are focusing. And with Fucoidin, we see that it activates both of these activities, which is probably you know, the best what we want. Mm, okay. Well, that's interesting. Usually, like the uh, all these darker pigments, uh, berries and uh, like dark, dark leafy green vegetables, they have like this uh, flavonoids and uh, antioxidants that have like the sirtuin activation because like they they do cause like a small amount of stress to the body and sirtuins are almost like uh, stress reaction uh, genes that turned on by exercise and fasting and uh, calorie restriction so they are experiencing like a small, small amount of stress uh, by uh, consuming those uh, compounds yes yes yeah so some of them may induce stress and then activate sirtuins there are other compounds that may be directly binding to the to sirtuin protein and okay. um helping it so yeah <laughs> you know these are uh, all good strategies um but yeah th there is more work that needs to be done to find really potent activators mm -hmm. yeah but um you also mentioned uh, in your, your like your papers and uh, research that the um, sirtuins so are basically uh, needed for uh, the function of nad which is uh, also like a very uh, common uh, this longevity uh, enzyme uh, right, so it's a little bit the other way around. NAD is needed okay. for sirtuins, <laughs> <Gotcha. right? laughs> because it's a cofactor. Uh, so sirtuins, for their enzymatic activity, they need to bind the molecule of NAD. Uh, and um, there are studies showing that as we get older, NAD levels decline in our cells. Uh, so that's why you know people are taking things like NMN or NR supplements to boost NAD levels. Uh, so that improves the function of the cell of the mitochondria and also improves sirtuin function. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, but what is NAD then? We're going to like a brief pr primer. Well, it's it's a cofactor for it. It's required for sirtuins, uh, for the function of the mitochondria. Hmm. Almost like uh, needed for like all these uh, different processes in the body, like energy Exactly. So it's a, it's a very important molecule in the cell uh, for the proper functioning of the cell. We, we need an AD uh, and uh, boosting an AD level. So that's been, you know, very, mm. there was a, a lot of interest in that. And yeah, people are taking supplements and uh, report, you know, that they have more energy from that. Mm -hmm. Right, right. Uh, but how does the body, uh, what is the reason why this NAD decreases? So what is the... Uh... You know, what, what does it go well, lower? there is still research going into that. That's a very good question. Why does it? So there was previously, there was a somewhat simplistic explanation saying that, well, there is more DNA damage and it activates enzyme called PARP1 uh, or other PARPs which use um, NAD when they are activated. Uh, but more recently, that doesn't seem to hold true because you know otherwise you would inhibit part one and you know solve the problem but we need part one it's mm -hmm. very important to for dna repair for maintaining our dna in proper shape so part one may consume an ad uh, very transiently upon stress part one will consume an ad but it's unlikely that this is really the cause of the decline during aging there is something else going on uh, so there was uh, more focus lately on another enzyme called CD38, uh, which is, you know, enzyme that's part of the immune system. It may be activated as, you know, sort of part of age-related inflammation. And it's a very strong consumer of NAD. So people are looking, you know, maybe we should inhibit this enzyme. Although we still don't fully understand why 
is it activated and what, what, what is it doing? <laughs> so before, you know, I recommend, oh, let's just inhibit it. No, I think we still need to study this better and understand what's going on. And, you know, just taking extra NAD supplement is probably safer than, you know, try to inhibit some potentially useful enzymes. <laughs> Right, right. <laughs> yeah, because yeah, like if you uh, do something like that, especially on the genetic level, then uh, you may don't you don't know like the downstream effects of uh, what's going to happen. Like you know, if you turn off this gene, what's going to happen to the other genes and uh, those things? Right, and what we don't want, we don't want to weaken the immune system. So mm -hmm. before we fully understand what's going on there, you know, mm -hmm. any these supplements they proven to be safe as well. So people are taking them, although, you know, still long-term safety studies, we, we don't have them yet. These are all fairly new interventions, but short-term they seem to be safe. Right. Yeah, like the, what I've also, also seen is that um, most of the NAD gets lost for like inflammation and also these repair processes. So if your body is under higher amounts of stress and uh, damage, basically, then it uses NAD to, you know, conduct these repairs, repair processes and use as they're doing. So yeah, if you're just under that much load uh, and uh, stress, then you're gonna get lower NAD faster. And part of the reason why maybe like younger yeah. people, younger people have higher NAD loads is that they don't get damaged that easily. So to say, like they have a higher resilience and their their antioxidant defenses are also more uh, robust. Whereas with age, you see uh, these antioxidant defenses also going uh, down and weaker, and uh, which then increases the burden on the NAD uh, system as well. So it's like a downward spiral almost. <laughs> Right, right. So it's like, you know, the same kind of the same work that takes more effort for older organisms, mm. so it consumes more energy. Uh, so that is true. I think another important point is that NAD decline, it doesn't explain everything. So, for example, with sirtuin 6, it, it needs NAD for proper function, but it's not that sensitive to NAD concentration. So you need just a little bit for sirtuin 6 to be active. Uh, so I think it's it's still very important to find specific activators of CERT-6 because we cannot just get away by taking an AD that's not enough. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, so what are the different ways of, uh, let's say, let's start with like the natural ways of increasing NAD first. Like uh, how does the body produce its own NAD in the first place? Well, it's just, um, you know, it's, part of the vitamin B complex. So I think, you know, it's important that you eat healthy diet. Uh, but beyond that, you know, it's very difficult <laughs> really uh, to change that. I think it's, you know, it's very important from multiple perspectives that people eat healthy diet and exercise, but um, otherwise, um, you know, uh, again, it, it, it's also maybe you know, when you start interfering with these systems, like, you know, if you take too many group B vitamins, there may also be certain undesirable effects. Mm -hmm. So I think we have to be very careful with uh, what we take. But uh, with NAD itself, uh, I think, you know, those supplements seem to be safe and uh, there are beneficial effects that are now being reported, not only in animals, but also in humans. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the main ones are uh, the uh, nicotinamide riboside and uh, NMN. Mm -hmm. Yes, those two. What is the uh, like? What are the differences between them, and what does the research show? Like, uh, which one is better, or which one? <laughs> which one well, works? this is a very um, you know new field with a lot of controversy and debate, and some people will say no, only NMN, only NR. Uh, to me, it seems that they are both doing the same thing, and one is converted into the other, you know, within cells. So the question is, which one is more stable? Uh, which one is better able to enter the cell and enter the mitochondria? And you know, I think the jury is still out. People take either one and report beneficial effects. So I cannot really vouch that one is better than the other. Mm -hmm. Which one do you think which one do you think personally is better than <laughs> I don't know. I think either one is fine if it's a comes from reliable source and you know that the, you know the pill you are taking actually was um you know the company where you purchase it uses third party laboratory to evaluate and you can see that you know that's really there that is really what is being advertised i think either one is fine hmm, okay 
Uh, yeah, I, I personally also think that, yeah, like um, there is like new one, subtle nuances between them, like uh, nicotinamide riboside, once it enters the cell, then it gets converted into NMN eventually anyway. Uh, and whereas like if you take NMN directly, like how does that, you know, work, etc. Like I do think that both uh, probably work, so to say, and uh, yeah, like small differences. Well, but, yeah, but... there was a lot of a debate, you know, we were uh, just uh, had a conference on NAD metabolism, um, a couple of weeks ago, and uh, you know there was a lot of discussion which one is better, and also how do they enter the cell? Because people were looking for a transporter for NMN. You know, can it get into mitochondria? And recently they identified the transporter. So it seems like either one is fine, and there is a transporter for either one. So mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, I think as as long as really the pills are good quality and contain you know what they should, <laughs> it's fine. Yeah. Is there like any, uh, like I've also seen like some uh, research that it has like some negative effects on uh, cancers and things if, if uh, like there's... Well, you know, it does worry me somewhat uh, because, you know, NAD, well, it's not really energy. It's more like a cofactor that's needed to produce energy. Mm -hmm. uh, but cancer cells, they sort of, you know, they require a lot of energy to grow. So uh, maybe for people that... Uh, are at higher risk of cancer, I would be careful uh, before taking those extra supplements because it boosts uh, growth of any kind of cell, but a yeah. cancer cell would be very undesirable one to boost the right. growth. Um, so it is a concern. And we don't, that's when I said we don't have long term safety data uh, where the long term supplementation really promotes cancer development or not. So we, we don't know. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, that is something to keep in mind. And uh, especially, I guess, if, for example, somebody had cancer and uh, is a survivor and in remission, maybe for those people, yeah, would be careful. Maybe you don't want to um, <laughs> sort of provoke it. Right. I mean, then for people with low risk, then, you know, why not? Mm. Yeah, it's, it's almost like uh, the cancer is just there hijacking the energy that gets created uh, with NAD. So uh, it's not that the NAD is directly boosting the cancer. It's just that the uh, energy that's created from NAD, NAD uh, is uh, stolen by cancer, so to say. Like they just cancer exactly is very, right. Very... So NAD itself is not, you know, it's not the, it's not going to mutate the cell or right. you know, <laughs> make normal cell into a cancerous cell. Uh, but if there are sort of sleeping cancer cell like in remission and like all of a sudden they get this energy boost maybe you know it could make mm. them grow right yeah so it's uh, yeah like a uh, nuanced or context dependent like mm -hmm. most uh, people who don't have any like say cancers uh or like ser serious ones are uh, then uh, then for them it's probably safe uh, whereas who do, who do have some something like that then uh, they should be more careful yes yes that's true gotcha um, but what, what about uh, like this different, I've also heard a lot of uh, benefits about uh, apigenin and uh, hyaluronic acid. Those are also like uh, considered, you know, there's like a, one of new compounds <laughs> involved with uh, like longevity. Well, I can comment on hyaluronic acid because that's something we study. Um, yeah, so there are many benefits. Uh, it's already been used uh, uh, somewhat, you know, in the clinic for arthritis treatment injections in the knees. Uh, but what we discovered that in naked mora, so these are these long lived rodents that live 10 times longer than mice. Uh, they have a lot of hyaluronic acid in the tissues. Um, and uh, um, it's, it's a unique form of hyaluronic acid because hyaluronic acid, it's a sugar. So there are molecules of sugar in the long chain. Uh, and th those chains in the mora are maybe 10 times longer than in human. Mm -hmm. And so that was very different. And the properties of hyaluronic acid really depends on how long the chain is. So the short oligomers of hyaluronic acid, they can be pro-inflammatory and they usually appear at the site of injury, uh, but longer molecules do the opposite thing. So they're anti-inflammatory uh, and they, are connected to, you know, they protect the cells from damage. Um, so that, that's really the connection. And 
we see that in the morat, there is a lot of hyaluronic acid in the joints and, and they are very resistant to osteoarthritis. We couldn't even experimentally induce osteoarthritis in them. Uh, they are also resistant to myocardial infarction. So you do surgery on them to induce infarction and there is no almost no damage to the heart. And they have a lot of hyaluronic acid in the heart. So it seems to really work for them. <laughs> Uh, and we made the mouse where we put naked mora gene for synthesis of hyaluronic acid in this mouse. And these mice live a little bit longer, not like naked morads, but um, about 10% longer. Mm. Yeah. And they have less inflammation. So that's another uh, something we would have expected from you know anti-inflammatory effects of it. So it's a very interesting molecule and it's very safe again because it's normal part uh, of the tissue and that's why you know it doesn't really do any harm because it's, anyway it's part of uh, connective tissues in most right. animals why do the uh, naked mole rat have so much of it like uh, i know they live on the ground and these uh, tunnels uh, but you know what is the reason that they would have developed something evolutionary like reason you know what we think that's because we also find it in other subterranean animals. Uh, we find a lot of hyaluronic acid in the blind morad, which is a very different creature, not uh, related to naked morad, but it also lives underground and we find they make a ton of hyaluronic acid. So we think they evolved it uh, because uh, they need to squeeze through those tunnels and they need very stretchy, flexible skin. Mm -hmm. And naked morad skin is very supple, you know, <laughs> mm -hmm. Uh, it's funny that those mice that I told you about that we gave them extra gene from naked morat, uh, they also have very supple skin. <laughs> right. <laughs> and so probably in evolution, that's why subterranean animals increased production of hyaluronic acid. Another reason could be that subterranean animals, they experience a lack of oxygen, so they need to be resistant to hypoxia and the uh, hyaluronic acid may also be helping uh, protecting the cells in hypoxic environment. So if you think about humans, uh, we never really had this kind of evolutionary pressure to increase our hyaluronic acid because we don't live in tunnels, we don't you know, experience hypoxia, but we can borrow it from naked morals. Mm. <laughs> By uh, taking the hyaluronic acid. Yeah, well, you know, this is still kind of an open question because uh, it's a very large molecule. So if we take supplements, we don't know if they get absorbed uh, in the same form or it probably gets broken down in the digestive tract. Uh, but there are studies showing that even, you know, taking extra hyaluronic acid has benefits. So maybe even if it gets broken, but when our cells receive, um, you know, that extra building blocks, so then it stimulates production of hyaluronic acid in our tissues. Okay, well, that's interesting. <laughs> funny, funny, yeah, like how, how a lot of these um, long living animals do uh, live under these uh, slightly harsher conditions, like uh, you mentioned hypoxia and uh, these tunnels and things. <laughs> so, yeah, like kind of goes to show that this ad adaptation or uh, resilience against stress is uh, pretty important just as a whole overall uh, strategy. That's true. It could be adaptations to stress, or it also could be somewhat different reason. Uh, because those extreme environments, that also means that not, there are not many other creatures living in the same mm, environment. Right. So these animals can be more protected from predators, and that allows them to evolve adaptations for longer lifespan because they just don't get eaten too quickly. So for them, it's beneficial to live longer. Mm. Right. So you also have, a, have to have a gun to protect yourself against the predators. <laughs> right, because if you think about, you know, what animals are very long-lived, so you think naked morat. Um, but there are other, you know, there is really a correlation between how protected the creature is and then how long its maximum lifespan is. Like porcupines, for example, uh, they live uh, up to 20 years, which is quite a long time for a medium-sized rodent. <laughs> but mm. because they have these quills, you know, not many predators can take them. And uh, for example, birds, on average, birds live longer than mammals because they fly. So again, it makes it easier for them to escape predators. Mm. Well, uh, that's interesting.
Um, are there any other like um, interesting compounds uh, you're excited about or interested in? Well, you know, we are very interested lately in different compounds that could help um, suppress those transposons or genomic parasites. Uh, and I mentioned CERT6 activation, but here, well, you need to first activate CERT6 and then it helps. Uh, but then there may also be compounds to directly uh, silence transposons. But, you know, here again, we are now we are not talking about um, sort of supplements that are perfectly safe. So these are actual drugs. Uh, so there are drugs that are used, antiretroviral drugs that are used against HIV, for example, or hepatitis. Uh, they have, they can also inhibit transposable elements, but there are side effects. So at this point, of course, these drugs are not recommended for healthy people. Um, but what we are interested in is how to make alternatives that are safe and uh, don't have that those side effects, but can just be specific against transposons. And mm -hmm. then we can, you know, maybe directly address uh, that cause of aging if we can silence transposons. Right. And that would in, that is more like, yeah, like towards gene therapy and uh, that sort of thing. No, well, <clears throat> those could be the small molecules. Uh, so the this family of drugs that I'm talking about, they're called NRTI or nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitor. So they inhibit the enzyme reverse transcriptase that HIV virus has. Hmm. Um, I mean, the problem with those enzymes, well, they also inhibit transposons, uh, but the problem with them that they have some side effects, for example, they can poison mitochondria. Um, so when people take them for a long time, there are certain side effects and yet yeah, that's not, everyone shouldn't just run and start taking them unless the benefits really outweigh the risk. Mm -hmm. um, but it, they were, those compounds were developed to specifically target HIV. And we are thinking, you know, developing similar compounds to target transposons only. And that may have fewer side effects. And, you know, that's just one of the directions. Right. Gotcha. What do you think about uh, like uh, rapamycin and the metformin? Well, uh, you know, the benefits were demonstrated, especially for rapamycin. For metformin, I think, you know, it's fairly safe for people with uh, diabetes, obviously. Uh, now, for rapamycin, the effect in mice was very modest, I must say, with metformin. You need to really hit the correct dose if you're a little bit above, then it actually it's not beneficial. Mm -hmm. um, so I think for people with diabetes, obviously metformin is a great choice. I don't know whether it's a good idea to take it for people without diabetes. I think the, the jury is still out on that one. For rapamycin, you know, similar, I mean, it's not similar, it's different. So with rapamycin, the effect on laboratory organisms like mice and worms and flies is very robust. So it really extends lifespan in these model organisms. Now, is it good for people to take? <laughs> you know, and here comes, it also has side effects. Mm -hmm. And some of them are pretty serious because it's an immunosuppressant. Right. And uh, it is used by transplant uh, recipients to suppress the immune system. Um, so all these studies in mice were done in mice that were kept in uh, sterile laboratory conditions, not in the wild ranging mice. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I would say rapamycin is a good proof of principle that you can delay aging uh, by slowing down certain metabolic processes. Uh, but um, just taking rapamycin by itself, you know, I wouldn't recommend, I, I'm not taking it. Right. Uh, because of those side effects, uh, we don't want that. Uh, I think there may be safer alternatives developed, obviously, mm -hmm. to rapamycin. But at this point, you know, there was a big clinical trial by Restore Bio that initially they had promising results for a short-term trial with rapamycin. Then they increased uh, their population. They've done a bigger trial, and then that one didn't work, mm -hmm. uh, which also is uh, somewhat discouraging. 
So I don't know, you know, some people um, promote that, well, you can take rapamycin not continuously, but let's say you take it once a week and it does certain effect and then your system recovers so you can rebuild your immune system. But mm. I, I don't know that there are too many side effects. Um, <laughs> right. I think I would take just take it as a proof of principle idea. And then, you know, we can build on that and try to develop some safer alternatives. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so like a good example of this, um, like the downstream effects that you want to avoid. So like uh, rapamycin works by suppressing uh, the mTOR complex and uh, mTOR is, you know, growing. Uh, it, it has been shown to like promote all growth, like all cell growth, uh, cancer cell growth, as well as muscle cell growth and those things. So yeah, like if you suppress mTOR, then yeah, you may inhibit some uh, cancer growth and aging. But at the same time, you also may develop the increased risk of like osteoporosis and frailty and sarcopenia and those things because you suppress exactly the, uh, right you don't want to be frail you know again. Yeah. <laughs> yeah exactly so yeah it's a yeah i think yeah there probably are some like safer alternatives unless you have like some specific uh, condition um but yeah well, it's been a great talking with you uh so uh, we'll start uh, wrapping things up um before i ask my last question uh where can people learn more about you and uh, your work well, I can invite people to visit my webpage for my laboratory and, uh, um, you know, it's uh, Vera Garbunova um, at University of Rochester. Um, I don't have a Twitter account. Maybe I should, I should get one. <laughs> I'm always thinking about it. But otherwise, I think, you know, through my publications is probably the best way. Okay. And, uh, yeah, we're going to put all the links in the show notes. And my last question is... Uh, What's this one piece of advice or a habit that you wish you adopted sooner? <laughs> well, I think uh, eating healthy, <laughs> eating lots of fruits and vegetables, uh, seaweed, of course, <laughs> right. and um, some moderate exercise. Hmm. <laughs> Just the basics. <laughs> yes. Well, you know, one thing I tell my students, you know, it's difficult for people to color restrict on consistent basis. It just doesn't work with human psychology. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, maybe skipping lunch, you know, I'm eating breakfast and dinner and I'm trying not to have lunch and that helps my productivity. As well. mm. Yeah, yeah, that's a good, good advice. And uh, I agree there that the uh, intermittent fasting uh, can like mimic a lot of these benefits of color restriction and uh, it's much more like a preferable way for people to do yes. like... Uh, to some, this, this kind of thing. All right. Uh, well, listen, I, it was great talking with you and uh, yeah, looking forward to your future work. Well, thank you. It was my pleasure.